title of the sermon is Christ who is faithful and true sits enthroned and what this means for us. Christ who is faithful and true sits enthroned and what this means for us. One verse this morning from Revelation 19 starting in verse 11. The word of the living and true God says this, Then I saw a heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Lord, help me as I uh, deliver and preach this message. Thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ, that when we likewise will see heaven opened, that same Jesus will be there for us. Help us, Lord, as we meditate on this, be with the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Here in Revelation chapter 19, what we see here is heaven unveiled, and front and center is Christ. Now, this is not the Christ in the form that he was at the conception. There is a baby in the womb, nor the Christ who was born in a manger at Bethlehem. This is not the Christ who was... uh, uh, talking uh, and give, delivering the Sermon on the Mount. All of those are true events in the life of Jesus Christ. But at the ascension of Christ, He entered into the right hand of God to sit enthroned in heaven as Lord of heaven and earth. And so the Jesus whom we pray to and the Jesus who intercedes for us and who sends blessing upon our heads, this is what He is like. He is faithful and true and he's seated at the right hand of God. And in many descriptions we find in this great book of Revelation, he is depicted as a sovereign governor and Lord. His eyes are like fire. His voice is like the power of many waters. And his feet are like brass. And he is clothed in an un- unbelievable, bright, white robe. This is who Christ is. This is who we see here as heaven is unveiled. And this is who He is forevermore. The Scripture teaches that He is risen to reign. And His name is faithful and true. Now think about this. When the Scripture says He is faithful and true, it's not just describing something about Him, but when it says He is faithful and true, it's saying this is who He is. Not just... He sometimes is faithful and He sometimes is true and trustworthy. But when it says, the one in heaven sitting on a white horse, He is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, He judges and makes war. Faithful and true is not just something about Him. It is who He is. So let's get to brief definitions here. When the Scripture says that Jesus who's seated enthroned at the right hand of God is faithful, this is what it means. He's trustworthy. He's someone who can be relied upon. He's a person who has showed himself in the transaction of business, in the execution of commands, and in the discharge of his official duties as totally trustworthy and able to be relied upon or leaned upon. This is what Scripture means when it says Jesus is faithful. Scripture goes on to say, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful true. Uh, still. And then it says, He is true. He is the opposite of fiction. He is the opposite of lies. He is the direct sovereign opponent to deception and falsehood. When it says that Jesus is true, it's saying He is the opposite of counterfeits and fakes and phonies. Rather, being true, Jesus is in His very nature, not just something about Him, but who He is, He's sincere. He is reality as a man. He is unfailing. And in every respect of who He is, He is true, real, and genuine. It says of the Scripture, in God there is all light and no darkness. There is no shadow about Him. There's no hidden closet. There's no dark corner about God. Everything is true. Everything is light. Everything is goodness. And here's what He is in His wisdom, decided to be like towards us. Faithful. Steady. Unwavering. And so the Scripture says, He's the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. 
And by His Word, He's promised He will be faithful to a thousand generations. Now according to the Scriptures, to go back to Adam, there has been nowhere near a thousand generations in world history. If we're to take the timeline of Adam until 2024, there's been a very small amount of biblical generations. Basically, right around a hundred or less than a hundred. If you take a generation to be a hundred years or slightly less. But God is faithful to a thousand generations. That means God's faithfulness is just getting started. God's faithfulness just began. It's nowhere near exhaustion. It's nowhere near the end. But just as he told Father Abraham, I'll be a God to you and to your children, to a thousand generations. I shall be their God and they shall be my people. That promise just began. That promise is just in the outset. A thousand generations is way, way in the future. And so whenever heaven is opened up and it's like heaven parts, it's sheared apart, the Apostle John sees one. Though there are billions there, an uncountable multitude of angels, archangels, saints, men and women who have believed in Jesus Christ, there is one who gets the attention again and again of the Apostle John, and it's Jesus. Ascended on high, enthroned ever heaven and earth, and here's who He is. True and faithful. Notice, as we consider the ascension of Jesus Christ today, when Christ ascended into heaven, who did He take with Him? No one. He didn't say to Peter, hey Peter, you know on second thought, I better bring you with me because you have a lot of insight and a lot of charm. Hey Peter, John, I'm going to drag you guys with me because I need your help. He didn't say that. He didn't say as he, go, when, as he ascends up to heaven, he's taking any of us. He doesn't say, I, I'm, when I get up to heaven, I'm going to set up an HR department or a group of counselors to give me advice. When Jesus ascended up to heaven, he himself alone, full of glory, ascended into heaven, and he alone was taken up into the glory cloud to the very near presence of God the Father. What that means, church, what that means for us, and I say this as respectfully as possible in unison, first to myself and then to the congregation, because it is true that Jesus ascended up alone, not with counselors, not with advisors, but he sent it up alone, forget about yourself and worship him. Christ is the Lord of your family. Christ is the Lord of your business. Christ is the Lord of your days and your weeks and your years. Christ is alone is the Lord of your wallet and he's the Lord of your mind. And so honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your family. Take every thought captive to Jesus Christ. The most important thing in your life is your good relationship to Jesus through the simple and yet potent gospel that was preached last week. What this means that Jesus ascended up alone to sit at God's right hand is that Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, Christ is the head of our consistory. Therefore, Christ is the head of all the work that we do here. Christ is the Lord, not only of the past, but of the next 50 years, of the next 500 years, and until affinity. He ascended up into glory to be head over the whole world, King of heaven and earth, and especially His body, the church. And so church, because Christ has ascended up on high, we have no business expecting the world to take the claims and the counsel of Jesus seriously if the church does not first do this and model it to the world. We have no business expecting the world outside to take the claims and the word of Jesus seriously as the ascended Lord if we don't model this as a church, as a congregation, first in these walls because the scripture says judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And so as much as we look at the world and we say we wish people followed Jesus, we wish people took the faith seriously and didn't take the name of the Lord in vain, amen, I agree with all of that, but judgment begins in the house of the Lord first. And if we would like to see the world one to God, we'd like to see um, the world following the, the, the commandments and the love of Jesus, which I, I pray is a, a desire we all share, we have to do it here first. We have to do it in our homes first. Church, you will never be faulted for taking Jesus too seriously. You'll never 
uh, get, on, get on anyone's bad side who's a Christian for taking Jesus too seriously. But the church, as the world has, has often suffered and went down sorry paths for taking Jesus too lightly. For taking Jesus half-heartedly or in a defeated way or in a haphazard way. We will fall into many pitfalls for taking him too lightly, but we'll probably do quite well and go forward in true faith and in true uh, trustworthiness of God and his scriptures by taking Jesus seriously. And all you have to do for that, don't take my word for it, read the end of Revelation. Read chapters 18, 19, 20, 21, and tell me if the Jesus who is presented in these holy scriptures is someone that you can afford to take lightly. Someone that you can afford to think little of. Someone that you can consider following only part way with half a heart. No, what I see in, at the end of the Bible, the, these, these last pages of the scriptures, is that Jesus sits enthroned in heaven and he visits his church on the Lord's day to give them his word. And just as Jesus delivered his word to the seven churches in Asia, he corrects them, he encourages them, he leaves them with his blessing and his grace, but desires them to grow in the grace and the holiness of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not someone we can afford to take lightly. Jesus is not someone we can afford to follow only part way. Rather, in Revelation 19, 20, and 21, we see an enthroned sovereign king, an all-powerful governor, an all-worthy savior, and the one and only one who offers both life to the repentant and the sword of his word to the disobedient. Of all the things Jesus is, here are two things Jesus cannot be, irrelevant or optional. Of all the things that we can say about Jesus, of all the things we can praise Jesus about, here's two things he'll never ever be, irrelevant or optional. Rather, he is the one who brings meaning and cohesion, relevance to all people, and the one who is necessary, critical, and essential, because it is Christ or chaos. It is saved by the cross or lost in the fires of hell. He is critical, he is essential, he is necessary, he is Lord of the living and the dead, and as heaven is rent apart, the Apostle John sees he sits on a white throne, his name is faithful and true, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And so let's take him seriously. Let's take him dead seriously. Not only because he's Lord and sovereign, but he's our friend. How ought we to treat our friend? How ought we to treat not only the one who's our friend, but our Savior? Not only a savior, but a king. Let's take him seriously. One way we can do this, to tie in the message of the ascension into this special day we also find ourselves on with Mother's Day, let's take his word seriously about the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment is to honor thy father and thy mother. Because Jesus is the ascended king, he says, follow my commandments. Do what he says. Here's one way. Let us honor our father and our mothers, as we consider uh, the wonderful ladies in our life that have gone above and beyond to make us who we are, to bless us, to guide us, to teach us, all sorts of things, let us follow the ascended Lord because he said, this is how life will go well for you. This is how you will live long in the land and prosper. That mom and dad that God gave you, honor and love them. That's top tier priority. It's the first commandment on the second table of the law. So, Ten Commandments, the first table is the first four. Those four commandments deal directly with how I relate to God. The second table of the law, the, the, the last six commandments, deal with how I relate to people. And the first commandment on the second table of the law is honor your father and your mother. One commentator, one pastor theologian says this, very well and rightly does the Lord begin the second table of the law with the honoring of our parents. For our very next duty, after our duty to God, is the reverent love that we owe to our parents, of whom next after God we have our life and by whom we, from infancy we are brought up with incredible care and exceeding great labor. Greater are the good works that parents do for their children, greater is the cost and labor that they bestow on them, and greater is the care, grief, and trouble which they take for them than any other person in the whole world. No matter how eloquently we express this, we are unable to express the love and the tenderness of our parents. Here in the fifth commandment is not only the father named, but also mother in express words set down in the law of God. 
And he, he says this, this is his opinion. He says, the godly and the virtuous mothers who feel and abide more pain and grief in the bearing, bringing up, and nourishing of their children feel that more than even the fathers do. For no small cause, therefore, have we the name of mother precisely expressed in this commandment. Whenever at all, therefore, children, children, hear this, whenever at all children shall have an opportunity to speak of their parents, let it always be with humbleness, reverence, and love. And let that affection and their reverence also go on to obey their parents. And so this is how the, the ascension of Christ touches down into real life, because his commandments are exceedingly practical, exceedingly get into everyday life. How does this touch down into your world? Because our theology needs to get into the world, real world. We have to get from the word that's in the pulpit into the pickup truck. And this is one way. Christ who sits enthroned will also take care of his beloved people. He does this because he's seated, fixed, unmovable in heaven. And therefore, we have a standard of justice and truth, honesty and goodness. When all people around us are losing their head, Christ still sits enthroned at God's right hand, seated, steady, able to do what is needed for the protection of his church and the healing of everyone who comes to him by faith. Look later at the same chapter in Revelation 19 at verse 16. Look what the scripture says. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To relate the ascension of Jesus Christ further into the theme of uh, our family life and particularly of mothers, because Christ is seated at the right hand of God, consider this, the church and the family are the first lines of welfare. The church and the family are the first lines and bulwarks of welfare, not the state. I don't need to say this, but a good reminder would be to go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And where, there we find that when there is, for instance, someone in need, and the example in 1 Timothy 5 is a widow, a woman who is left alone, has, has no husband to care for her, the Apostle Paul instructs that the first line of, offense, uh, of defense for her is her family, her children, her cousins, her sisters and brothers, let them take care of her. And if she has none of those, then the church is the second line of defense to care for those that are needy and oppressed. So since Christ is ascended on high, what that means practically is this, that we're to care for each other as families first and as a church second. We're not to pass the buck on to someone else. We're not to say, well, I'm not really in the mood to take care of my mother or my brother or my sister. God says this, your family takes care of each other. And, it, and the scripture says, if any man does not provide for his family, he's worse than an unbeliever. He's worse than an infidel. And so the scripture says this, because Christ is ascended, because he's faithful and true, that actually means practical implications for family life and church life. That's why things and this is a small example, but this is why things like the Bucket Brigade are not only good, but they're called for. Because as a church, we're called to look after one another, not to pass the buck, not to say, well, the government will do that somewhere along the way, but families care for one another. And if there is no family around, church, adopt that person. They are now your mother. That's how the kingdom of Jesus works. And so as we uh, are in the midst of... Uh, an election year, consider this. Our primary concern should not be about the White House, but about your house. This is how this works. It's called localism. What can you realistically influence and win to Christ? What's more important than who will be in the White House this year is what's going on in your house today? What's more important than uh, what's going to go on in the country in the forthcoming months is who's going to bring lemon cake to luncheon this year? Who's going to count the offering this year? Who's going to guide the church spiritually this year? Who's going to change your son or daughter's life this year? Who's going to invite those neighbors to church this year? Who's going to open up the Bible at dinner time to teach the family this year? All of those things are of infinitely more importance. Your house, your church. This is what we are called to because Christ has ascended up on high. Those are things we have realistic influence and sway over. Mothers and fathers in the church and in the family are to be the primary sources of care and health 
for the children, not peers and not professionals. Because Christ is ascended up on high, he has given unto the church true authority and through the church to bless families to go into this world and truly take care of one another. The household and the church are the lead instructors and teachers of the new generations, not the media and not celebrities. And so mothers, point your little flock, point your family to Christ who ascended up on high. Remember in the book of Judges, we saw Deborah. She is called a mother of Israel. And what did she do? She taught her children the faith of the Lord. She led them in the knowledge of God, and she was an example as a mother of Israel. Mothers, tell your little flock that he is faithful and true. Tell them that when he says is true, even when the world says the opposite, and teach them that even when your heart fails, the one who sits enthroned, faithful and true, he remains faithful still and always will. So what I hope you see here, just in this short meditation out of Revelation, is that as much as the ascension happened 2,000 years ago, none of us were there to see it, it has truly real world implications for how we live how we guide this church, how we live at home in our households. Because if it's true that I have a king in heaven, that means that I'm not king. If it's true that I have a king in heaven, that means I have orders to follow. And if it's true that I have a king in heaven, that means I'm guarded and protected, and so let me go and live for him and leave the consequences also to him. He will be faithful, he will be true, and that's enough for me. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to you, we ask that you would apply this message in our hearts by faith. Thank you for the ascended Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may his, the knowledge that he is seated, that the one who is truly God and truly man is at your right hand, rolling and reigning because he has been risen from the dead. Lord, help that to come out of our fingertips in the way that we deal with one another, in the way that we find truth and guidance in this, uh, in this world that we find ourselves in. Help us, Lord, to care for one another and in that way be a true example of the kingdom of Jesus Christ uh, to those that would watch, and may we be a light in the midst of darkness. Enable us, Lord, to do this, not by our own strength, but by the Holy Spirit that you, you poured out on the day of Pentecost. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Stand with me as we pray together this prayer that Jesus taught us, and as we read earlier from Psalm 47, to sing praises with understanding, let's pray with understanding. Consider these words as we pray them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, we do not have the Lord's Supper today, and so just go down to your, uh, the next hymn there, Blessed Assurance, page 362.